Hey, Diti. Hi. Hi. Okay. So many questions about this book. So many questions about process. Obviously, I know you um, from a bad character. I know because our books came out at a similar time. I met you when I was touring. And I read that book. I just, I remember devouring that book. And then when I got this one and I saw the paper. I devoured yours. You know, Thank you. I, I remember that. Yeah. And it's like one of the great joys actually yeah. of, of touring with people. You get their books yeah. and you get to read them and and yeah. um, and lose yourself in someone else's work, which is all honestly kind of a blessing when you're when you're touring. But um, the thing that I I remember about that book, I think it might even be on my bookshelf right here, is it was slim and it was tight, <laughs> a straight zip through, right? Right. Yeah. You have gone the opposite direction. I will say I zipped through this too, but when I got it, I thought, wow, 500 pages. Then I thought, wow, trilogy. So I just want to know where <laughs> this started for you. Right. How it sort of came to be. It does feel like a, both a departure from your previous work, but also very much in conversation with it. Mm -hmm. so I'm curious, where did it start for you? Well, there is, okay, so there's this, there's the, there's a couple of things. There's the practical reasons for, you know, age advice, and then there's the creative decisions. And the, so I, I'll, do you want to hear both? I do want to hear both. And, um, mm -hmm. and maybe just to help us launch into that a little bit, people are describing this as a crime thriller and a family saga. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you agree with that description. And what and what about you? Were you were you writing toward both, or or did that have nothing to do with it? I was I wasn't I I I, I wasn't thinking of any uh, ways to describe the book when I was writing it. I did not ever think of it as a crime thriller. It was a it was always a family. Yes, I can I can I can see that. You know, a, a Delhi novel which is propulsive. I mean, I'm, I'm I don't write marketing copy. Clearly, I don't know how to describe my own novel, but I mean, that's I guess that's what we all do, right? You write it, and then you find different you know labels. Um, and um, the, I think because it's very it's propulsive, which is why I, a lot of people have said it's 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 a thrill, and it starts with a it, it starts with a car crash. Yeah. starts with people dying so there you go you know there is crime. that right yeah. got, we've got a dead body or yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so 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 i see see i see why that uh, you know it's, it's being slotted into a certain crime thriller category but i, I never really wrote towards that it, it's interesting it's always really interesting when you write something and then and then the way the world receives it absolutely yeah, yeah. Absolutely. i mean we know that right yeah absolutely. yeah so where did it start for you then so it's so after that character, which is you know that slim novella, basically that you know which which is kind of like a really focused exploration of desire and trauma and a coming of age story of of a girl in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. I had other I um I had a couple of other novels that I had written or partially written, um and well <laughs> they they the publishers rejected them. My editors didn't like them. So. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, so they, yeah, so they were they were actually uh, set in the yoga world because I was I was a you know a yoga teacher for years. I I, I kind of had a, this great uh, view of like Westerners coming to India and their ideas of India versus what India is or was. So so they were um, you know apparently the the characters were unlikable. The protagonists were not. You know, I mean, there were various reasons. Yeah. You know, it's it's always interesting what people like, what they don't. So, um, so then I was actually trying to figure out what should I write. You know, what should I do? And um, my agent at the time said, you know, why don't you write about all those rich people you hung out with? You know, mm -hmm. and I, I I always had an idea that I would at some point of time explore this Delhi that I knew very intimately. Yes. Um, well, while I lived in my, you know, in my 20s, I, I, I lived there, I worked as a journalist, uh, I partied a lot, um, I met people from all walks of life, um, I collected just so many stories, and I always had an idea that I would find some way to, some form to put them in, and 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 then I thought, okay, and I started to figure this, this out, and um, Age of Ice, I mean, like, it was born, and it kept kind of growing and growing and growing till it became, well, actually, a 700-page 
<laughs> Wait, yeah. a 700 page, is that the first part was just 700 pages? No, the, yeah, the first, manus the first draft, the manuscript that the editors first got was uh, 700 and then it was slowly whittled down to about 500 now. So, and now I'm thinking, you know, it could have, you know, it. <laughs> It, it, I had enough time away from it, and I, I've been recently I've been looking at it because um, I finally have the advanced copies, and and you know now you can see like okay it could have been you know it, it's always interesting to see it after months and to think okay that maybe maybe that could have gone or maybe not I mean it's 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 it's, it's like it's it's a strange thing yeah it is a strange thing and then the other part of it though I have to say is that one of the things that I'm enjoying is that okay sentence by sentence you just have propulsive sentences right this is something I've always loved about your work it's very clean and you kind of zip through but then the level of detail is really amazing you were talking about being a new Delhi a, you know a Delhi girl and also kind of growing up in that world and so many of the details in this are so both richly imagined and also I just felt I felt like I was just there seeing it as well um I'm thinking specifically with somebody like Ajay's life right and what mm -hmm. what he was going through can you tell us a little bit about him first just so that people know who we're talking about so Ajay is this boy um he's this young boy that we meet um you know actually in the early 90s he's 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 a he's a Dalit, which is basically he's an untouchable. You know, the Indian caste system. You have the the higher ups, and then you, you go way down, and then you have the Dalits, the untouchable. So he lives with his parents. They're landless laborers um, in a small um, little kind of village. And his father. I mean, I'm going to go very quickly. His father, um, the the goat. Something happens with the goat. Um, runs away and, and goes into the upper caste landlord's farm. So his father gets beaten up um, as punishment. And this all still happens. I mean, I can, you know, so this is, it, this is not like, I mean, it is obviously fiction, but it is all based on real life incidents. And then he eventually, uh, his, his mother takes a loan to help pay for the father's medical bills. Uh, father dies anyway, can't pay back the loan. So um, in order to pay back this loan to the contractor, Ajay is, uh, as an eight-year-old boy, is sold and taken away from his family and, and sold to and goes up to the mountains where he starts to live as a houseboy of, uh, of, of a couple, of a young couple who are actually really nice to him. So it's almost like he's sold into a form of benign slavery, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then eventually grows up. He's a, he's a farmhand and, um, uh, and becomes this kind of like strong beautiful boy who ends up um through many different circumstances and things that happened to him as the servant to the the other main protagonist he uh, off the novel which is Sunny Vadia who is the son of uh one of the most feared and powerful uh businessmen in North India and the only son who dreams of moving away from his father so so Ajay is this loyal watchful servant um who through his devotion to Sunny and his loyalty um ends up paying a very high price for for this this ambition he has of becoming someone and he always wants to go back I mean his he dreams of going back to his family mm -hmm. but he also dreams of becoming someone so I mean there's there's all kinds of things is this young incredibly sweet um orphan I would say a boy who who then who who then ends up um well I'm not gonna I mean no. this is the thing the yeah. novels aren't, aren't out yet should I give it away no I'm not gonna give my you don't need to give it away yeah, I mean yeah. I feel like I feel like we're we can send him on this trajectory and the and the readers and listeners can yeah. know that he is that is the sort of trajectory that he is on yeah. and I want to get back to Sunny um in yeah. a minute too because it seems to me that even when we're talking um Sunny seems like somebody who might have been in your circles who might have caught like a Sunny-ish person right um mm -hmm. or sitting in that house or talking to somebody who's good friends with a sunny, you know, like, I feel like yeah. that, that um, I can see traces of that for the character of Ajay, what kind of research did you do to, to get that character and to, to create such a rich character? Oh, so it's, so it's interesting. So I, as I was saying before, I did spend my twenties uh, in Delhi um, working as a journalist, mm -hmm. uh, but I wasn't a very good journalist and I had an extremely vague, um, brief, which was I was a trends correspondent, which basically meant that I could had to go and hunt stories. Um, 
uh, I will go back a little to the time that this is the um, this is the early arts and the economic liberalization of the 90s are bearing fruit. So what's happening in Delhi is this great explosion of art and culture and money is pouring in. So you have like this kind of underground cool art scene, but now brash capitalism has capitalism kind of invaded and crashed the scene. And, and, and you have this explosion of ideas and freedom and opportunity. And at that time, of course, like it's all incredibly exciting. Um, the, the place that I started working at, I wanted to do the crime brief. They were like, no, there's this new lifestyle thing that's going on because the admin said that brings in a lot of money. So mm -hmm. that's how I'm being, basically I become the trends correspondent, I'm driving around Delhi, smoking cigarettes, just talking to people, having yeah. a lot of fun. That's yeah. my day job, night job, private parties. And, and most of the parties in Delhi are obviously in people's homes, as I said, private parties. And, 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 and there you're apparently hanging out with the movers and shakers, but actually, I realized later, and this is the thing, in my 20s, I didn't really think too much about this, uh, but we were cohabiting that space with another kind of person. And those were the, the, the silent men, mostly, the, the guys who were serving as the marginalized servants, right? They're, they're, they're there, they're so intuitive that they were, they're there to pick up on every need, but they're, they're always quiet. They're always, they're watching you just to make sure that you are always served. So I remember just being in these spaces with these guys um, and thinking, I, I mean, at the time thinking, what are you guys thinking about us? You know, what's what's happening? Like, where do you come from? Who are your parents? Where, which village, um, you know, are you from? Because there's always a migration from rural to urban areas. So, you know, and, and, and thinking about it at that point of time, but never really sort of exploring it. And it was um, years later when I had sort of left this, 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 this life behind. I'm living in Goa, but we were traveling a lot for work. Mm -hmm. And I was in the mountains living in a, in a guest house um, when I did meet a young eight-year-old boy whose family had sold him into, uh, he told me his story. It was a vague story, but it was about this, uh, this you know, being sold to to help pay off uh, a debt, mm -hmm. and and I and, and I remember that instant. I kind of put that those those loyal, watchful servants at these parties, mm -hmm. um, you know, together with this young boy, mm -hmm. and that's how the the story was basically born. That's how I felt that I had my novel. You know, like it wasn't just the those years of decadence and privilege in Delhi that could have made the novel. Right. Uh, though after that character, I did actually briefly explore the idea of kind of a less than zero sort of novel. But I just felt that, you know, I, I didn't want to do just that. I needed to add something that needed to be weight because in in, in India, in Delhi, uh, in, in well, in India, it's like all the 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 excitement and the the hopes and dreams of those those years when we felt the benefits of the of, of the economy opening up. I mean, later on, I realized that so much of it was built on corruption. So much of it was built on the suffering and exploitation of so many other people. Yeah. And that's that's what I wanted to capture. This is the totality of this world. The you know it, the tragic interdependence of these extremities. Absolutely. So, yeah. So yeah. that's basically so, a very long and rambling answer to your question. <laughs> yeah. Right, it's a great answer. Um, yeah. It's a great answer. And it also gets to this thing that um, I think a lot about, which is when you are writing about a life that is not your own and that is outside of your circumstance, right? And deeply outside of your circumstance, which is something that, that all fiction writers do because we can't be more than one person. Um, when you're doing that level of thinking into and research, are you in conversation with people during that time or for you, were you in conversation with people that were both of, you know, of that circumstance and living that life or was it also, was it taking that bit of that boy's story and then also wedding it to other articles you had read or other information? Like, how did you do that? What level of it was on the ground talking to people and what level of it was book research and what level of it was imagination? Because for me, that's always trying to kind of break that down in, a, in the most, um, 
both respectful as in doing the work, you know, respectful way, but also understanding that fiction is something that in which you have to both um, think through that aspect of it. And you also have to think through the story, right? And how the story works. So I'm just curious about how that worked out for you in terms of, in terms of research versus story. Well, I mean, it's, this is hard because to, it's a difficult question to answer because I feel like I have, you know, 20 years of, of research just yeah. from, uh, you know, living my life and, and always talking to, you know, just years of journalism, but generally as well, just gen chatting with people all the time and collecting their stories. Um, and um, so, so there was that, and that kind of like seeps into your subconscious and, and then pours out, you know, in your work. A lot of uh, reading, a lot of reading papers, academic research, actually. Um, so that's uh, a nonfiction mm -hmm. and to like investigating how processes work. Um, and then, but for the, the, and then there's, you know, then of course there's the imagination as well that comes in. But it, I can't, I, it's hard to quantify how much, how much, how much. Yeah, 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 for like, sure. It feels like a really mysterious process sometimes that you're not, you know, you're yourself not aware of. And then it Absolutely. just kind of like, yeah. So, so it's just like all, all of it is like a kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. everything is just comes together and then you don't, you don't know which, how much of it was like lentils or, you know, spices <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. What's happening um, yeah. with someone like Sunny. So let's talk about Sunny for a minute. Okay. Coming from a place where I have plenty of access to privilege and power, I still know that there are many rooms in which um, my livelihood is based on how the people in the room with much more money and much more privilege, how much they are, how much they are benevolent toward me. Yeah. If you really handle that dynamic um, well, there's a creepiness to it um, that you handle well. And there's a way in which we see both sides of it. The person who both takes for granted, the people that are um, working for their favor and, and the person who is trying so hard to stay in favor. Um, and it comes through with Sunny really seamlessly. So I'm so curious. Can you tell us a little bit both about that character, where he came from, um, and what his role in this story is? So I've known a lot of Sunnies in, in my life because I went, so I was um, sent to a boarding school um, when I was 11 years old or 10. Um, I lived in Bahrain during the Gulf War and my, my parents felt that the region was unstable. So they sent me to this kind of boarding school in the foothills of the Himalayas. It was the, um, it was a, it was a girls school uh, in this town called Daradun, which is full of kind of like posh elite boarding school. So, you know, you had the Dune school, which is the, this Eton of India, you know, and, and it grooms the future, you know, prime ministers and uh, powerful industrialists and all of these people. Like you have so many people that in who are in positions of power and influence in India will be from Dune School. And then there's another school called Wellen Boys. So I, I watched a lot of these young boys who were the sons of, of powerful men mm -hmm. grow up. Um, and because I had friends whose brothers were these people, like, I, I, I watched them turn from like these young snotty boys into uh, privileged wayward men into now I, I see as some of these men are now like members of uh, politicians mm -hmm. and uh, businessmen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, one's the son of like, uh, uh, he, he's basically uh, a god man's son. So he's also a god man, you know. So like these, and, and I've seen them. Wait, since really quickly like, for oh. our listeners, can you break down god man real quick? <laughs> I don't know if I can do it quickly. Just, I mean, in whatever way you can, just because I, I know it's a shorthand, but I but I'm not sure everyone will be familiar with that. Well, in in, in India, and I, I I think it's a Hindu thing. I'm not sure. Like we have these men who are very close to God or have, or speak to God, and then they become religious leaders, or they become and it's almost like cult leaders, yeah. um, and then they get taken to be God. Like there are men who who are basically direct descendants of God, and it it happens. It, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was basically bipolar, but uh, occasionally, you know, now I figured out he was bipolar, but he was a, uh, he's a salary man who'd uh, leave his, you know, after a few months of working would just leave all his belongings behind and go on the road and start giving speeches. And he was also a god. Wow. 
Wow. <laughs> so I had that too. Yeah. That's and give you away. recently figured out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few years back. Because everyone always used to talk about my granddad being a bit crazy. And okay. I was, like, yeah, and I was like, why was he crazy? Can can you can we break this down, please? Uh -huh. And then he died with, uh, before I was born. But yeah, and then he'd give away all the possessions and then he'd go into depression for a few months. And I was, I did my master's in psychology. I was like, well, he was just bipolar, you know, and where he was. Amazing. Like, That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So sorry yeah. for this diversion, but yeah. also totally amazing. All <laughs> right. So you've met these, these, these boys, as you said, these yeah. boys that then get to these high levels of power. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very high yeah. levels. And I'm, and, and it's great because I'm seeing also uh, now I'm in my, I'm in my early forties. I'm seeing reversals of fortune happen. I'm seeing these boys then turn into like powerful men. Some of them have now like their families have fallen into disrepute or they're no longer the elites because the, the elites have also been replaced in India by a kind of new kind of religious elite. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of them are politicians, sons of politicians, or now also politicians, mm -hmm. um, which so ha it, it feels like I've just known this world and I never came from um, a lot of money. My parents kind of scraped together money my father worked in a bank to send me to this school so I always felt like an outsider which means you're more watchful you know you're in that room mm -hmm. you have access to that room but you're also kind of like highly aware of the fact that you shouldn't be in that room <laughs> because you aren't as wealthy or powerful you know you're not you're not wealthy but you're there so you and that, that's why I was constantly like kind of taking I don't even know if I was taking mental notes maybe it was just again coming into me it wasn't like I have ever had this ambition that I was going to write about this world but then it just you know when it when it when it came to like writing this I was like okay this is this is what I know yeah. so well and this yeah. is also the story of India so mm -hmm. of modern India so you know so that's how yeah so that's how the sunnies of the world like I just grew up with them and and then just watched them you know become of who yeah. they are and I'm still yeah. watching them so it's of course I mean, in this case, he comes with a very powerful mm -hmm. father figure, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, so even the he, is, yeah, within yeah. the power, right, within the axis of power, he's not at the top of the chain. No, either. yeah. Um, and we see that in a couple of different ways, but he has this kind of access to the power and the cloak of power, right? Yeah. While also um, at any given point in time, he can be thrown a bit out of it, though not yeah. entirely. And right? also he wants to take um, the the family business into something more legitimate. You know, there there's this is like mafia uh, m money. I, it, they're, they're, they're basically it, not illicit, but it's liquor. It's liquor mafia. Liquor mafia is a little bit dirty in India uh, because th this the backstory is that Gandhi said that alcohol should be basically be prohibited. Mm. Um, so because of Gandhi's original idea that India should, you know, basically be completely alcohol free, um, you know, good, 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 God fearing people never entered, um, you know, alcohol distribution or the alcohol business. So it was always right. something that like people who didn't care that much did. So it was, you know, um, slightly always a bit dirty a bit seedy mm -hmm. so so Sonny you know wants to take this money that his this this vast amounts of money and 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 basically launder his family's reputation and turn it into um you know building he wants to build the city he has these grand ambitions and um and his father is just like you know what no i just want to make vast amounts of money and he's ruthless his father and sunny doesn't have that ruthlessness he lacks it so so that that tension is what i wanted to explore as well like how is he going to do and also the tension and the fact that he sunny in the end also just wants his father's love because he hasn't had that he's had a barren upbringing barren childhood yeah. so they've taken over this cafe in manali and everybody in their, you know, in that in that area is impressed with both their money um, and the way they are sort of moving through this world as this kind of nouveau Indian reach, right? With yeah. this, they're not trying to hide their money. They're not trying no. to uh, cloak it in some sort of suffering or penance. They are just living. Actually, what she's saying is you have lost your culture. Yeah. And he has this brilliant way of really landing on her Western fantasy yeah. of 
Indian culture and who he should be. Yeah. Versus who he is. And I, what I love in specific is there's this line where he says, we're very, what is it? It's like, we're very good hosts. Yeah. But, but don't just, mistake that. Yeah. Right? Don't mistake that for, don't mistake that for you being able to tell us who we are essentially. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you picked up the scene and you like it because weirdly enough, I mean, I, I wanted to expand on the scene and, and the, the the novel that was, you know, well, now it's in a manuscript form that rejected was, you know, kind of expanding from this idea of foreigners in India versus the reality of what happens in India, which is like this violent land. It's not peaceful, you know, it's not where you're going to go and find yourself, though you want to come and find yourself. Um, so, um, of course, though, when you try and sell that to an American, they're going to be like, you know, seeing them. Hey, but can't I find myself? Okay, that's great. But like, we're gonna <laughs> find me at the end of this, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <so. laughs> but it's also still spiritual, right? We've got some spirituality in there. Um, yeah. Sort of the red, sorry, please. Anyway, yeah. um, but the the thing that is, there was also something wonderful about seeing both. There was a way in which um, he was so able to deftly lay out the whole power paradigm and specifically who gets to be innocent and who doesn't get to be innocent, who gets to be corrupt and who doesn't get to be corrupt. And it's really interesting because right at the side of this whole fight is Ajay witnessing. Yeah. Right? It's his witnessing the, the sort of power dynamics of that in itself. So there are just so many levels of power happening at any given point, right? That's one of the really delicious things about reading this is in every room, every every scene that you've created, it is fraught with so many different lines of power. Um, yeah. I wondered as I was reading it, did you, because it comes so naturally from him as a character, I was wondering with, with parts of this, did it come, did the plot come to you first or did the characters come to you and they sort of dictated the plot so i don't uh, yeah so again i don't have um i don't work like i have a theme or a concept and i'm going to create characters around that um so no the characters um are, are all based on people that i have um met or known in my life and 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 it could be just you know or a story that i've heard from someone else and then so i i that's you know, so I have these characters and then I basically throw them on a page and then, Great. yeah, and, and I have do. the beginning though. Yeah, I have the beginning and then I see what um, what's happening and then they kind of like jostle with each other and then the scenes come from that. But after a point of time, the characters take their own life. Like they're not then based on people and then they become the characters and I stop thinking of whoever I'm thinking of, you know, it's just like, then that's just Sunny Ajay, and you know, then it's like that's it. And then they do things that it, you know sometimes, you know, and that I haven't planned at all as well. And then everyone else has to respond and react. And and you know, this process is so mysterious sometimes and strange and weird. Like, and then you just kind of go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it is messy. It's organic, but it's messy. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, but there's I don't know any other way to work. So. Um. I do want to get to it's I mean it's it's funny because I as you're saying that I'm just thinking too of I think I can feel that in the scenes. You know, like I feel like I'm when I enter some of these scenes I'm thinking it will go one way or another but there's something that happens in in sort of the alchemy probably while you were writing it where the scene shifts and it becomes something that I also didn't anticipate happening which is I think <laughs> My guess is that's also partly why people are calling it a thriller because it's literally, oh, I had no idea that was about to happen, right? There's that kind of thing that's happening, which is gorgeous. Um, there's also, I do want to make sure that we get to, am I going to say her name right? Neda? Neda, yeah, you, you got it, yeah. All right, so I want to make sure we get to Neda um, because she is in this sort of- sort Yeah, of she's a third main yeah, she's a third person. Yeah. yeah. Okay, tell yeah. us a little bit about Neda, where she came from. I had some ideas, but I want to hear it from you. Um, <laughs> No, no, no where's your ideas? Okay, first I'll tell you and then you can. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, no. So now, okay, other way you want to do it the other way? Because I'll just tell oh, you. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I'm, I'm always interested because then, you know, otherwise I might influence what you say. So, okay, I saw traces of just from what I, um, obviously what I have known 
of you and your journalistic past, um, just the edges of it. I felt like I understood, I saw the traces of that in, in some little bits of mm -hmm. what you told me about your life. And also the, um, there are edges of an outsider to her as well. There's a way in which she is kind of um, between these worlds that to me felt particularly um, rich and really rife, right? There's there's a way in which she she is both witnessing everything, but also very complicit um, in yeah. so many things. Um, and that and that place between wanting to stand in not judgment, but uh, in a place where you can assess and make meaning of something, and then being completely undone by the tumult of it becoming part of the story instead of outside the story yeah. um, felt to me i mean it implicated me so much as a reader it implicated right. me as a human right? right um as a person who would much prefer to as twitter loves to turn somebody into um an instant enemy and decry my own moral compass as far above theirs um i felt when i was when I was reading her, I felt like I was watching sort of the wheels come off the cart in different points. And I felt myself, you know, questioning myself about so many different choices that I make just living a life. Um, so I'm curious about where it came from for you. Uh, I, I, I just love your description. It's so it's so apt, you know, it's so spot on. Um, Netta is as a character, I've, I've taken a little bit about, you know, I was I worked as a journalist. I, I, you know, I, I knew Delhi, um, but I don't have the same family background as her as I gave her a completely different, I come from a socially conservative family. Uh, we, you know, I, I didn't have cool parents, <laughs> not at all. I don't so. know why I find that so surprising, but amazing. <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, my parents are so uncool, <laughs> you know, I mean, my, though my mother has now uh, has, has told me that I need to tell, or in interviews, uh -huh. her, only, her only wish is that mother is cool please okay deep deep mother is so cool yeah and that. i said let's okay she's super out of cool. the way yeah. right yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so let's get that one <laughs> out of the way and then yeah so um but so now those parents um are a little bit and her family is a little bit again based on people i knew in school um or you know in university that the you know who lived okay, I, I didn't live in a cool part of town i lived on the outskirts and um over the river in, in the east, which is, you know, not great. And then, um, so she lives in this kind of very, very, um, uh, one of the, 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 the most, a uh, kind of powerful um, colonies um, of, of the city, which basically speaks of influence, power, access to, you know, power. Um, and, and if you, if you know Delhi, you know that it's all, everyone is obsessed with where they live. You know, it's a really a place of like where you live can say so much about who you are or that's what people think anyway. The first thing you often used to get asked in Delhi is where do you live? And then like you start making these mental calculations. Okay, this person lives there, therefore blah, blah, blah. So right. it's, it's so, so Neda has this incredible address and which opens, you know, the, all these different like gates, you know, she can just go in and, you know, in her battered car, she always she drives this old used up Maruti 800, but it doesn't matter because she has the right education, the right location, and 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 she. But at the same time, she's she doesn't think of herself as someone who has privilege and access. This is and this is somewhere I kind of also interrogated myself and who I you know as someone who now understands I come from a you know I, I had. I have a, so much privilege, especially when you put me in that stratification and in, in society, and you know, with, with everything, you know, you're there near the top. Still, you're not aware of it. And she, she thinks she's a good person, but she is complicit. She's so complicit. First, I mean, she's curious, um, and she she wants to experience life. Um, she's also bored, so she she's basically been parachuted into this job, but she really has no reason uh, uh, on you know she shouldn't be a journalist because she but her mother thinks okay like I'm just going to speak to the editor of the magazine or the newspaper and that happened a lot in Delhi in, in in those days you know if you had the right 
family, they could just pick up the phone and speak to their friend who happened to be the editor or, you know, of some of, of a magazine or the owner of a television, news television channel. And there you got, you got a job. And then it depended on you whether, you know, what you made of that job. But um, she, and, and then she basically falls in with Sunny Circle because she's just curious to see where it goes and because it's so tempting and seductive. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is a, another thing about Delhi. And I remember this very, you know, from my years of living there, it's a hard, harsh city. You know, it's, it's, it's basically, you know, incredibly beautiful uh, and alluring, but you have to have, I mean, especially as a woman, you have, you, you have to have these kind of like a way, ways to access it and, and to really experience it. And, okay, and wait, tell me, tell me a little bit about that because my, my next question was actually going to be the character of Delhi, right? Because yeah. the character of Delhi is now in your books um, twice in two pretty different ways, but there is, there is the kind of thread of commonality between them. Um, when you say as a woman, you have to have, you have to have, what do you mean that, by that? As a woman, you have to have what to access Delhi? Uh, well, protection in a way, or at least, you know, say you're, you're, you're driving um, in Delhi in a, or you're using public transport um, and you are, or, you know, kind of like your own car and it's, it's not a great car and, and you're going around the city, you're getting out, you know, you don't have chauffeurs i mean it's very easy to have chauffeurs in india i mean it's not like you know it's it's labor is cheap so it's it's not like the rest of the world like a lot of people have drivers but um i know from my own personal experience that it, delhi from the um, back of an air conditioned suv uh where you're basically gliding over the city versus delhi in this kind of like hot uh, auto rickshaw you know where you're feeling the whole city but it's also like you're feeling it in this visceral way which is exciting but also sometimes terrifying you know there is the, there are these two levels of Delhi um one of the top one right in right like in the center of it both are extremely exciting but but that that Delhi that, that you experience when you're at the top of it when you're gliding where where checkpoints don't matter where it's 2 a.m and you're driving the roads and suddenly there'll be like these police manning checkpoints in the city and then they'll see your car and because you have a certain address you know and and literally the driver will put the window down and he will say something to the police and they will salute you because they've realized who's the who the car belongs to mm -hmm. whereas you're driving alone um it's 2 a.m and you're a woman you'll get harassed you know Possibly. So Neda, when we're talking about the level of um, privilege she has, is she then, would you then describe her as the person who, if she were alone, she would be harassed if she were driving, if she were just, but once she gets in with Sunny and his kind of group, then glides through in a way that she hasn't, or what would you say about well, her? I, I think that, I mean, Neda still does have an incredible amount of privilege and she can yeah. still like glide around even in her beat up old car, but, but it's just that when she enters Sunny's world, life becomes really smooth and seamless you know and she and she transitions to this world of and also like there's suddenly like there are parties and 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 there's this in there's a different Delhi that she's experiencing through through being you know his companion girlfriend that she hadn't had access to earlier and this Delhi is extremely exciting because it, we've uh De India has just come out of this kind of socialist planned economy and the and suddenly you know uh, bars and restaurants that were previously not there are opening and there's this in, it's an incredibly exciting time to be in Delhi it's it's not like we had all of those things before we didn't mm -hmm. suddenly malls are opening you know the first multiplex the first uh, club the first this the first that like it, it, we're experiencing the first of everything mm -hmm. and that was you know that, that, that it was that was exciting i mean again i have to always say that you know at that point of time it was like the excitement without understanding where it came from without ex under understanding that corruption inequality and compromises but you know and, and but it was you know like i i remember when i was 18 or 19 going out with my friends um 
for drinks at a hotel bar and we were approached by um, a, you know, a, a photographer, a newspaper magazine, a photographer who said, I've never seen girls sitting alone and drinking. This is like the first time. Can we do a shoot, a photo shoot? You know, there was so many. <laughs> yeah, it was wow. just, yeah. What year so, was that? What year was what, 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 what year, year was that? That was like in, that was about 99. Yeah. Yeah. Seems right. So, you know, the first uh, TGIF, which is, a, you know, a distant memory now, but that was the most exciting thing to happen to people, to us, you know, in in, in India. Coca-Cola, we didn't have Coca-Cola. I mean, you know, because you were coming, course, yeah, yeah you, you were coming ho for yeah. the ho holidays, and you were probably bringing gifts, right? Yeah, for your of course. Kids. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and ordering Kemba Cola and realizing it wasn't Coca Cola, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, well, up. like dumb American stuff. Um, but the thing, you know, this idea of this, the influx of a kind of, I want to say, a sort of um, an abundance, but it's only an abundance for very few, right? Yeah. Um, but also the idea of an abundance that is accessible to everyone even if it in fact only goes toward a few right yeah, yeah. the idea of here is a mall and we can all go here and we can all shop and we can all buy things even if most people cannot possibly afford to buy those things right yeah. Yeah. um and the bringing of that into the culture i'm curious about you said that you know you grew up in one way kind of seeing that that abundance and not re realizing that there was a downside to it when did you start becoming aware of that, of the downside? Like at what point in your own trajectory and your own sort of understanding of the country? Yeah, interestingly, it was the um, the 2012 Delhi gang rape, um, you know, the Jyoti Singh, when she got murdered, uh, raped and murdered. And um, of course, it was the brutality of the act itself. And, you know, it was horrible. And the, the sort of awakening of, you know, so many people understanding what was going on. I mean, we all knew that Delhi was always unsafe, but that particular act made me start to understand or investigate the process of corruption because it was, just, okay, the act is brutal, but why was it allowed to happen in the first place? So because of our uh, private buses were allowed to ply out of hours on these bus routes, uh, because uh, again, everyone is making a buck, you know, they've paid off the private bus contractors and owners have paid off the necessary police and cops um, so that when they're going through these checkpoints, no one is stopping them. So so I, I got in, interested in, in looking at the why of the corruption. And then that led me to also kind of understand my own complicity in the privilege that I was part of, that privileged world that I witnessed and enjoyed. Um, and it was um, interesting because then I started to think about complicity and compromise. Like the 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 poor, the rich in 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 India are compromising their morals, you know, and the poor are compromising, are made to compromise their dignity, uh, with again the expectation that maybe one day they will become rich and powerful themselves. As you said before, you know, you you are made to think that you have access; it's available to everyone, but really, how many do? So that, then I said, you know, then, and also then started to, to just read a lot about nonfiction, about, you know, how the way India works. And, and, and it's not just Delhi, it's UP, it's caste violence, it's political corruption and investigate every, and all these processes. And then, and, you know, this, this, all of this started to happen about 10 years back. So, you know, and that again, the, it didn't, it didn't I didn't think at the time that it would go into the book but I think you know it was just there in my again 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 in my consciousness and it just seeped through into the writing and I'm so so that's my 20s were kind of like journalism and you know partying and then um changing my life when I got married and moved to Goa and became like got into the yoga world um, and and then kind of like later on sort of started to look at the the modern contemporary India, you know, that I was born into or came of age into mm -hmm. and, and how it worked. So if we think of, um, I feel like it's a very um, 
I mean, you can tell me if you if you disagree, but I feel like the idea of this sort of um, everything becomes a product that can be accessed and that gives you status and that the kind of the capitalist dream to me seems like a very uh, distinctly American um, yeah. export um, in, in many ways. And I know here in this country, we've had a sort of, I mean, it's been happening honestly for um, decades, I would say this sort of real understanding that, oh, it's it's really not an accessible dream for everybody. It really is. And and slowly as the lines have slid, and I'm sure you've heard, you know, the 1%, there's, there's always been that idea of like who actually ends up with the wealth in the country and why is 40% of it, you know, held by the 1%. But then also, I think the pandemic exacerbated this in a very specific way where people could finally when they were made to stay home, they could feel um, the hours of their life that they have given in devotion of this dream that in that gives very little back, right? Yeah. Um, this sort of endless churning to have, you know, there's like the buy, you know, buy the car to go to work, go to work to, you know, pay for the car, that cycle. Yeah. Um, and the sort of the dismay with it, I feel like in the in the real um, disillusionment, right? Yeah. Um, with that, I think has turned people looking specifically inward to like, why did we get this way? And how did we get this way? And I'm curious if that in any way is, do you feel that that's also happening um, in India? I know corruption has existed, obviously, for, you know, centuries, millennia as well. Um, but specifically, when we're talking about the rise of the sort of the, the new rich, and the way that dream does or doesn't pan out for people and the way it sets into motion a population, um, a kind of frenzy of energy around obtaining something that may or may not ever come. Are you noticing that there as well, a disillusionment with that? Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's really hard to speak about India because it's so diverse. And, yes, you know, of course. Uh, this is so many, so many ways to like, there's so it's 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 i i don't know i can't i can't say um if you know that certainly with some people that i know yes but i i i still think that we are still very much enamored with the idea of you know of of money and then and there's also so many other struggles that india is currently in the middle of you know um so so you know it's a it's 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 really hard to know what what's going on i mean there's there's the the poor that are still trying to just kind of like you know survive you know there's there's crazy amounts of inequality you know we're basically living in a, a crony capitalist state um which is you know fast moving towards you know a very fragile democracy um where you know institutions are being are collapsing or near a state of collapse so it's 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 hard because you know there's so many things <laughs> there's so many like problems yeah. yeah yeah it's really hard to know you know right and there's you the know. obviously the yeah. religious fascism that we're you know yeah, yeah. that too yeah. that we're all quite aware of um so i'm curious now so this is a trilogy this is right. just the very beginning of this of this story right um, is the whole thing written? Is the whole trilogy written? Oh God, no, no. <laughs> okay, where are you in that process? Oh, go oh gosh, no. I mean, I'm, I'm writing, uh, I'm, I'm writing book two, but it's been, um, I, I, I go back to India next week. I'm there for a month. Um, I'm on the road again, um, because again, my process is so like, you know, it's almost serendipitous. Like, I, I, I get on the road, I travel, I do research, I meet people. Um, particularly this time in Punjab and, and UP. And, and then I'm, I'm coming back. Well, and then the book comes out, so there's going to be some amount of publicity and all of that. Yes. But yeah, but, um, yeah the, book two is, I mean, I'm writing it, but it's, you know, it's, it's um, I haven't even thought about the third one yet. I know where it's going. Okay. I know how it's going to end, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's but are you at all nervous because you are having this book come out while you're in the process with the second one? Mm -hmm. Are you nervous at all about the feedback from this one changing the way that you write? Because it sounds like with the first one, you just went fully into almost yeah. like a, 
you know, the trance, the best thing that I think can happen in fiction, which is a sort of, it's almost like a trance, right? Yeah, yeah. With your characters, they are telling you what is happening. You are reporting what they are doing. Yeah. Um, but you're not actively, it doesn't feel like you're actively making decisions so much as like trying to be true to the characters and their many conflicting needs. Yeah. Um, are you worried at all about the intrusion of the world into, into what has been your kind of private imagination? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm terrified, so. Okay, so um, do we have, do you have any kind of rules for yourself around that? Like, don't read reviews or don't look at Goodreads? Can I say, just, can I just say to you, don't look at Goodreads? Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I am trying to make this, uh, I think, um, I think I went in the other day, or was it, did I, did I block Goodreads? I'm not sure, but I mean, the book hasn't come out yet, so, you know, Goodreads is still kind of okay. Um, I am, I, I basically told my, um, editors and it, you know not to send me bad reviews yep. or, or only to send me you know there's unequivocally good reviews because it, you know you know what it's like you will always just pick that one thing they said right. and then you will fixate and obsess about it and it will it, and it does bleed into the work mm -hmm. so definitely um you know when my, my process is when I do actually get into the writing of um the book and then I'm just immersed I, I try not to participate in the world or at least you know be like you know just obsessive about it and wake up really early and and then go for walks and meditate and all of that and be really healthy and then and then you know that 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 kind of life is sustained for a few weeks and then you know I have, have I have to have a break and then I'm thinking but I am worried about how I'm going to try and sort of manage everything definitely um I mean there's yeah there's the time and there's also I think there's also that um the feeling of being watched which changes things a bit yeah. Right. I mean, and this is interesting because, um, you know, we don't have to use this, but I'm I'm really interested in how you dealt with it all. Of course. You know? No, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, I, I obviously I'm asking for a reason. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, because you're, you know, you're like a veteran, you know, I can, I can ask you this. How did, yeah. how did it work out for you? And what did you, how, how did you kind of like protect yourself? Yeah. I mean, I, so I, my book was a memoir, as you know, um, yeah. the second book. Yeah. Um, and so, and I drew my own face, which is really unnerving. Um, and I love, I loved it. I love it. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that, yeah, one of the things that I had to do was very quickly divorce myself from the reaction um, to the book almost as soon as it was out, um, because it was weirdly, and I don't know if this would be, I don't know, I didn't feel true for me for a fiction, my, for my novel, but with, um, I found with memoir, that any reaction actually was unnerving, whether it was positive or negative. Right. Um, That's because positive made me feel like uh, they don't really know me. They don't know me. Um, and and of course they don't because it's a book, it's not myself, right? Um, yeah. But when you commodify your own um, experience like that, that is, I think the thing that you risk um, which I really was, which definitely took a toll in some, in a couple of years when the book was out, um, was the sanctity of my own headspace. Yeah. The belief in my own um, brain, you know, mm -hmm. and the belief mm -hmm. in myself as, um, as a unit that was sort of inviolable. Um, and so I did, I had things that I told myself um, in that time as well. And um, and I guess I'm saying this also because I think I think it is going to be important for you to um, protect yourself and to pull down like a scrim and let you know and let your process be your process. We're in a time where people um, and readers um, are asking both good and necessary questions. Um, what are you writing? Why are you writing? Why this character? You know, all of those questions. And I also, but I also don't feel um, sometimes that some of those questions are, are asked with the idea of what does it take as a community to build a way forward into this art form, right? I feel like right. sometimes those questions are asked only with the spirit in the spirit of, um, I will criticize, um, I will only criticize, I will, I will not um, find a way into the conversation, which is certainly something I've dealt with many other authors have dealt with. Um, I think it's, it's part of the job hazards, right? right. Yeah. Um, but I, that's why I was asking. I just wanted, I was curious, um, both where your process was and also, I mean, 
listen, if you want to come up with strategies, I'm happy to do that with you, but just ways to sort of, you know, keep yourself. Cause I think there is the, the part of us that shows up to do the work also has to necessarily stay vulnerable and stay learning. Yes. Right. Um, so I think that's part of it. That's what I'm, I'm both curious about for you, excited about for you too. Uh, because when was the, the last book came out when, in what year? 2015, 2014 in India and then 20, yeah, 2014. Yeah, so right, yeah. seven, seven, eight years ago? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're back, right? Yeah. You're back into this place again of being out with a project. Yeah, and it's, it's in, you know, I mean, the pandemic as well, because everyone, we all turned inward and we just kind of like hanging out with, you know, our whoever companions or partners and cats or dogs or whatever and then like suddenly um you're out in the world and and uh, Matt and I we moved to Lisbon so we're not even in India so you know so that was and then because of the pandemic we could travel to India for a bit so so that has been you know it's like suddenly it feels like going out into the world is 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 an equal part exciting and terrifying so yeah absolutely okay wait i wanted to ask you about something um that you mentioned early on and because i always find things like this i'm sorry to do this for you but i find it incredibly inspiring you said that you wrote a couple of books that got rejected yeah yeah okay well one full manuscript and one half or so yeah can you tell me a little bit about that because i i feel like this is the part that no one ever hears about is is that kind of work the work that you do on the way to the work that gets published right yeah there are these other books. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Sure. I mean, so um, one of them is uh, with the tentative title of um, Mother India, actually, is about it was about uh, an American um, woman who comes to India, go on a yoga retreat, and then goes missing in the Himalayas in Ladakh. And then it's it's narrated by uh, an Indian yoga teacher, but she's a cynical yoga teacher who used to live in Delhi, you know. And, and now has kind of like exiled herself to Goa um, and who knew her and she, um, this this girl, this American who then goes to the Himalayas to try and find her. And then it's kind of like a story about um, what I always, you know, was immersed in and interested in exploring, which was, you know, this, this tension that between the American idea of India or just a Western idea, not just American. And of course the Indian idea of India and the Indians in India versus Westerners, because you always had Westerners writing those Indian novels, you know? coming in and yeah. finding themselves like you know I, I wanted to kind of like break that cycle and, and, and reverse it somehow but um it, it I mean I, of course I, I you know it was it's it's still it wasn't fully written and um but you know the character wasn't likable enough you know you have all these when you start to, <sighs> to yeah. Go around with the 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 again it is like also this is the um, western publishing you know there are certain novels that they will embrace and then there are certain that they will not embrace and they will say no this doesn't speak to us and the other one um was a novella almost another small novel called guruji which is a, a young germ about a it, it's a it's kind of a satire about a german yoga teacher who comes to india and and becomes a very big very big yoga uh, uh, he's not a yoga teacher in Germany he's a he's a young boy who grew up in post Nazi Germany and then comes to India in the 70s and he does the sort of trip that everyone did mm. at that time yep. and and then becomes a very famous guru and 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 then and then you know all of the things that happen but it's also like the story of India and, yep. and it, it's 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 a fun little novel um some people liked it some people thought it was weird you know and and this is it and and so and and you know so this is as you said like because I know that you've been through this process as well like it's it's really like there are projects that you love and you want to keep working on but then um there is this world there's a there's publishing world that decide you know like still decides I mean you know what what gets written and what and and the thing is that the money is all in 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 America and comes to publishing you know, if you want to publish in, you could publish in India, but there's hardly any money for literary fiction anyway. So, you know, wow. so, yeah. So when that happened, right? Yeah. You these, yeah. So you've worked on these books. What, what kept you going? <laughs> well, Truly, so, I mean, it's because yeah. I, I act like I'm just completely genuine question, by the way, and yeah. I don't mean it sarcastically. I mean it from the truest 
place of a person who creates for a living, right? And who yeah, gets absolutely. No, I, I I love this question. Um, it, the 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 feeling that you know couldn't do much else. Um, you know, there was the <laughs> there was wait okay. because of the pandemic or because just as a human, you're like, ah, no. all I can do is create things. So I'm gonna... <laughs> no, no, it was okay. I can teach yoga, but you know, <laughs> there's so many yoga teachers now, and they're better than me. And I got injured, so I was like, okay, I don't really want to be a yoga teacher. So, um. And, you know, it was just um, didn't ever want to have a regular office job. And I think I've had, you know, basically been out of that world for many many years to never even get an office job. It was like I was way out there. So um, never had a family that could, you know, support me financially, wanted to support me financially. And the same for Matt. And who used, he was also doing freelance stuff. And we were kind of getting by in Goa. Moved to Lisbon because we wanted to get into Europe before Brexit because Matt's English. So um, what kept us going was just this idea that if we don't do this, we probably don't know what else to do. And this is our last shot. Like, because, you know, it's also Matt I works like, with wait, me. Wait, is that what it felt like for you with this book? Did it feel like this was your last shot? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was absolutely like, you know, if this doesn't work, you're going to have to figure something else out. Wow. So, yeah. And weirdly enough, um, the uh, um, Age of Ice sold just before the pandemic in Frankfurt. So they got some deals and that kind of like totally was like, OK, this is good. It helps um, gave, you know, and then, of course, because once, you know, once COVID started, like the world just kind of shifted and it was strange and you didn't know what was going to go on. And and I know books were selling a lot, but you know, I, you know, everything was kind of uncertain and precarious. So um yeah, so that was it. Just throw everything at it. That was so interesting to me too. Then then because when you're throwing everything at it, part of part of the thing that I've always found really tricky with writing. Um, and I, tell me if this is not the case for you, but part of the thing I've always found really tricky, especially when it's about um, bills and getting paid is yeah. to give myself the time to write is to usually for me walk away from trying to make money yeah. in some other way, right? In some other like side hustle, some other small thing I can do, some other thing I can sort of quickly sort of rub together to like, you know, pocket a few thousand here, pocket a few, whatever it is. <laughs> Yeah. Some little thing that I can dream up. And so really stepping into the place of, um, no, you are allowed to imagine, you are allowed to um, dream deeply, you are allowed to go into that trance, right? Yeah. It feels like a risk. Did it feel like a risk for you at the time? Or oh, did God, it yeah. And it, so much, so much fear and uncertainty. And, um, you know, when we lived in Goa, I mean, life is, you know, Goa is way cheap, but at least at that point of time, you know, your rent and your bills were you know a third or fifth or what they are moved to Lisbon also because it's a cheap one of the cheaper cities in Europe but still it's Europe so you know it is more expensive had a couple of friends helping us um who 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 believed in us you know be, believed in our work but you know paying paying rent for us and but it was just like okay it, it was ex, in an extremely uncertain time and now I look back at it with lived in this tiny little flat um which was you know which had this great um just one wall of the flat which was like it ran through the entire length looked over the, um the city so you had this incredible view but you know the my my study or my desk where I worked was also our like dining table you know it was just it was it was like a garret you know and it was it, it you know didn't know anyone in in Lisbon had just kind of moved with left her life behind, cats went missing, the person who was living, I uh, was looking after them in Goa, the cat, my, a cat ran away. It was really kind of like um, sad, but also, you know, romantic, I suppose, now that I think about it, those, those years, um, till 2019 and the end of 2019, I was finishing the, the manuscript to send it to my agent in time for Frankfurt and, I got it. I got a, a, a writing offer for this magazine. Um, you know, again, you have to take whatever you get, right? And it was literally like two weeks, and it was like, "Can you do this?" It was. It was a fun writing offer. It was about me going in, like, going to some wine, um, going on a wine tour in around Lisbon. You know, and I was like, I have to take it because I need the money, you know, a couple of thousand, right? So took it. And but then it comes into the and and the you know it comes into the work. Like it's it's literally like 
having to finish the manuscript, write this. It was it was hard, but um, the relief when you when when you get told that no, this is good, and we want to publish you. Yeah, tell me about that. Okay, oh I want to finish it's... off with that if that's okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But... After after seven years and writing um, two other books that didn't go, tell me what it was like when you when this one went. Oh my, yeah, it was. Um, you know, amazing and and surreal. Um, it because it it kind of had this moment in Frankfurt in 2019 um, when, uh, you know, um, Anna, who was my agent, she just uh, you know there there was like this interest not just from uh, America but suddenly everyone you know everyone there was, you know, like publishers saying this is amazing and the, and and because I was still working on it, it was like going to them as a serialized kind of like, you know. Um, section one, section two, and then they were waiting for the end. They were like, can we, can we see the end? And it was like so much excitement and there were deals happening and all these emails coming in. And it was just like, uh, there was a sense that this is life-changing, yeah. you know, a little hope is, oh, oh, am I allowed to hope? There was that, okay, I'm allowed to hope because this is going to happen. And then there was this whole other um, post that a month after that, um, because um, my agent uh, had uh, LA rap and then he sent it out to people in in Hollywood and there was interest from there too and that yeah. blew up yeah that tell me about that tell me about that what movie. happened over there let's yeah about and you have to tell me about yours because I, I I read that your book's being you they are you all are you working yeah. adapting it yourself yeah okay yeah. we should talk about that but anyway um so that was that was really surreal because we had suddenly um you know, okay, you're, you know, you're happy about the publishing deals, you know, it's like, okay, I can live now as a writer, I can, I can pay my bills, you know, uh, but then suddenly it goes to Hollywood, and um, these producers, and then the networks come in, it's HBO, Amazon, eventually FX, uh, and, and they're all clamoring for it, and you're getting these crazy weird emails because of the time difference, I remember waking up at four in the morning, and there'd be these emails, um, from my agent saying that th there's another offer and then there's another oh, offer it wow. like, it, it, because it kind of like became a brief moment you know when they all want every everyone wants it and that was right. it, it, that was a, that was super exciting you know and just um and then and then talking to the um to these producers and then yeah tell were, me about that so you talked to producers and did you did you get an idea of what they wanted to do with it was it one of those things where you were like okay I like your vision for this or did well, you go by was, of the place? Uh, like, what did we you do? always said, yeah, didn't wanted to do adapt it into a TV show because it's just too yeah. big to you know to turn Literally. into a film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but uh, we always wanted to be involved, mm -hmm. and and uh, Matt writes um, scripts, so it was like we both want to be involved, and because everyone liked it so much, we could leverage that, and yeah. So we are basically adapting it and um, with FX. But we have a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, we, we're writing it at the moment and we're working with producers, but we're the creatives. Um, That's so, amazing. Wait, so are you writing it? You and Matt are writing it together? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's how is the, that process? That's, that's, it's great. Um, and, and, and that's, the, you know, been working on it with, but then again, that's another kind of journey because yeah. it, it, totally different from, um, I, you know writing uh, a book because well first of all you're working with um Hollywood and they have a diff very very specific idea of how they want the tv show to be even though they tell you they love you and you know all of that so so you I mean what what's happening with yours because no, I'm doing the same thing I'm um I you know I I also um had the experience of talking to a lot of different people. I wanted to adapt it myself because some of the people I talked to said things like, you know, it'd be great is this um, this memoir that's from the point of view of a brown woman, you know, who'd be great from, what if we told it from the husband's point of view? And I was oh like, yeah, God. cause we've definitely never heard from a white guy. <laughs> That'll be so interesting. Oh, um, oh no, so yeah. I know. Anyway, um, the process has been going really well, but I will say that also I do find it baffling talking to Hollywood people as opposed to editors because yeah, totally. editors are so like this doesn't work this yeah. is terrible or I don't believe this or can you look at this paragraph or you will turn in something and they'll just be like 
I don't know what you're thinking there, but you know, like just some sort of like very yeah. straightforward or, you know, in the worst case scenario, like if, if this is the way it has to be for you, then that's the way it has to be for you. I'm not sure I agree. Right. right but you right. get an idea of what they think. Yeah. I find it really baffling to be in Hollywood rooms because everybody says it's wonderful. It's yeah. wonderful. It's great. Fantastic. No, we don't like that. But no one says we don't like that. They just say like, oh, not that, but we love you. It's great. Yeah, so that I, is, I would so prefer, I really prefer the harshness of someone saying to me, yeah, act three just doesn't meet the mark. Right? Yeah, like, and this is exactly my experience, you know, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. So this, 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 this draft was amazing. Oh, this is, you know, this is like, we love your work. But, and then they basically ask you to make changes to every line, <laughs> you know, every scene. Can this happen? Can this happen? Can you basically send your protagonist to the moon? Because that would be interesting, right? No, I'm not yeah. I'm just joking. But, you know, yeah. the crazy demands, absolutely nutty. Yeah. Um, I've looked at it. So I have to tell you, I've started looking at it in a really different way now. Also, because frankly, I was, you know, my thing was an interracial memoir. And it's, it's now, again, shockingly, um, people don't want to talk about interracial strife anymore in America because 2020 happened and we dealt with all that and now we're onto something what? new. No, it's really? amazing. Oh my God. Um, so, but the way that I have been looking at the process because I didn't know how to write a pilot before and I didn't know how to pitch a show before and I didn't know how mm. to kind of sit in the rooms and listen to the feedback and sort of read between the lines of what was being said. Um, I'm looking at all of this as my education in that, right? If you had told young writer me, at some point you will be paid to learn how to do this new kind of craft. Yeah. I would have been over the moon. And yeah. so I've let go of the idea of like, this will definitely get made or not get made. I'm still really excited about it. I love the pilot. My people love the pilot. We love the pilot. Um, yeah. But I also feel like I'm so bad at reading Hollywood people um, and America and what it's able to handle about race is is such a shifting um, landscape always. So for me, a lot of and a lot of my life in general has been this idea of all of my writing has been what do you get to learn in this moment? Because what you learn is what you get to keep like no one can take it from you. Right. Yeah. What you figure out in the act of learning is yours. That's the thing that you get paid in, which feels um which yeah and i would also love to be able to buy like a new house and a new car and I, anything yeah, <laughs> a yeah. house um but yeah. but i feel like that's the thing that sort of kept me sane is that is the is letting the letting the learning curve be um a necessary part of the process instead of a shameful one mm. that's no, that's a good way to look at it and, and not get frustrated and, you know, want to bang your head against the wall. Every I mean, time. this is after years of being frustrated and banging my head against the wall, to be clear. So, okay. All right. yeah. <laughs> this is a hard one knowledge. I'm going to talk um, to you straight after a meeting and then we'll, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll, yeah, exactly. And I'll be like, so yeah. here's what we're taking away from this. <laughs> Only the sunshine. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, I'm so excited about this book coming out. I'm excited for you to get to see it out in the world and, and kind of have a moment of of feeling actualized in this way after kind of coming up with two other books and, and keeping going. I think it's an incredible testimony to what you've done and what you're giving us. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mira. This is, you know, it's such a pleasure. And thank you again for talking to me. It's so nice to, to, to see you like this. So yeah. Yeah. When you come to New York, we'll, we'll have to, yeah. uh, we'll have to go get those cocktails. Yeah, absolutely. Thank cool. you.